Um, and you know, the, there's, there's, there's definitely like, you know, we, we get into the meat of things, but, um, it, it's mm -hmm. definitely very casual. Um, so that, yeah. And, and long form. So mm -hmm. and I, it's just easier that way. Yes, I saw you on, on your website that uh, you dissect each episode into three parts or two parts. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That's, and I think that was, you know, I, I realized that we may be in the rare few who, who couldn't <laughs> listen to a podcast, you know, for more than 30 minutes. So I wanted to uh, save everyone. Um, but I didn't want to hold people hostage. Um, so I was like, okay, how can we create kind of like more digestible chunks um, where mm -hmm. people, you know, maybe in their commute, at the gym, washing the dishes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> doing laundry uh, can can listen and, um, you know, not feel like they need to find a place to sit for, mm -hmm. for like a couple hours at a time. It's a smart move. I, I, I never tried it before. I saw it with other podcasters. The way I try to work around it is with timestamps so that uh, each episode gets a timetable or table of contents. Yeah. Um, but the 30 minutes chunks is a good idea. Yeah. It, it, I, I mean, so far so good, I, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a, an experiment that we're running. Um, you know, there's certainly, you know, certainly uh kind of benefits to be going long as well um mm -hmm. and I, i definitely you know the the table of contents and kind of the timestamps help certainly help um you know just kind of if people if people are yeah not really interested in this <laughs> do, 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 just like you know just like jump ahead and you know sometimes i you know i do that too <laughs> um so you know i i i i think there's uh pros and cons about so my my search mode is when i see a new episode that uh catches my attention Uh, usually it's the picture and it's the speaker in the headline. Then I look in the table of contents and I test first uh, what the parts I like the most or the parts that yep. resonate the most with me. And when I look at the first one or two chunks or listen to the one, first one or two chunks, uh, then I decide to go the whole length or just yep. to switch to the next one. When there are no timestamps, it always looks to me like uh, it's like this black box. I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, what's in there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's actually a great. I I, didn't, I haven't like approached it that way. That sounds like a great discovery mechanism. Um, because, yeah, I kind of I'll just like start a podcast and just like boop, skip 30. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, did this I, this I like where this is going, and then yeah. I'm just like yeah, and just keep going. Um, but no, that's a great that's a great tip. Um, because I I you know th there's so many good podcasts out there. On, on all topics really um and you know it definitely it can become unwieldy to try and sort through <laughs> all of it <laughs> and figure out there's only so many hours in the day yeah, so yeah. you're like i need to like figure out which ones i'm gonna actually listen to um but i like that strategy a lot you mentioned before you treat podcasting like having a conversation with a good friend over a beer Yep. So this, I think it's, uh, <laughs> this is the question in my mind. Do you have a beer now <laughs> on the table? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just start, yeah, start the day, baby. Just like <laughs> off the, yeah, out of the, out of the gates, just starting the day right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's almost Friday. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if this was Friday, maybe we'd, uh, it'd be, uh, it'd be a different story. Um, but, you know, <laughs> definitely, that's definitely the energy we try to channel. Um, on the podcast yeah no, i mean I'm, i'm in central europe so close to germany and some people say especially in bavaria um yeah. that beer actually is no alcohol so you can drink it yeah. the whole yeah. the whole day yeah yes 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 that that's depth science <laughs> like, <laughs> science that is beer is not alcohol it is It's the water. <laughs> it's water. It, it tastes good. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about entrepreneurship uh, a little bit. You're in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, yep. and you decided to become an entrepreneur. Why? <laughs> yeah, that's that's really a great question. And I was, you know, uh, I was, you know, sitting down uh, for dinner with my wife and kind of like, kind of reflecting a little bit and. I think a lot of it, and, and honestly, growing up, so I grew up in an immigrant household, mm -hmm. and my my parents actually deemed entrepreneurship too risky um, because they left their home countries uh, and they were seeking stability. Mm -hmm. So when 
I, you know, broke it to them that I was interested in entrepreneurship, it really freaked them out. Um, you can imagine. And so my father was a structural engineer and my mother was in finance and both worked at their respective firms for 40 plus years until they retired. Wow. Same For, firm. 40 years, same firm. Same firm. That's impressive. Yep. Stability, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah stability. Um, and I think, you know, so, I, you know, my parents definitely had a different view on entrepreneurship, but I think I've always liked to build things. That, that has been a consistent theme uh, growing up. And, you know, an example would be an, my interest in games. Um, you know, whether it be board games, computer games like StarCraft or RPGs, mm -hmm. um, those kind of like the element of building has always fascinated me. Um, and I always thought that building, you know, in a game had a lot of kind of similarities to company building. Um, it's way lower stakes, like, you know, way lower stakes, but you get way higher kind of velocity and repetition and iteration mm -hmm. in, in, in one given game. So, you know, things like, you know, managing resources and under time constraints, you know, competing against your opponents, you know, multivariable analysis, strategy, tactics, you know, scenario planning. Um, and so I think that was really the start of like my kind of like entrepreneurship kind of building itch. Um, and even though, you know, I, I probably at the time when I was a kid, I was, I wouldn't call that entrepreneurship. It would just be gaming. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until I got to UC Berkeley that I, re I re kind of found a kind of a commercial outlet for this itch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the life sciences and, and wet lab research. And I think, you know, during my time on campus, that's where I kind of had a, like developed my passion for the life sciences and then found, you know, kind of had this like itch growing up and kind of combined the two. Mm -hmm. And that was when the magic happened. Um, and I think, you know, entrepreneurship for me and, and company building was really about kind of like to serve the community that I, like my people. Mm -hmm. And I really started to, you know, feel like part of the scientific community and I wanted to continue to build within it. Um, and I, you know, and I'll, I'll just give you a couple of stories here about kind of like what, you know, what really, <laughs> you know, basically got to the founding of Exceder and really kicked off the entrepreneurship kind of stint. Um, so when I, I've been in labs that are well-funded and also not so well-funded, <laughs> I, I've seen both. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it opened my eyes a lot. Like, you know, not every single lab can be well-funded. I wish it, would, it was the case. Right. Um, but capital and time are finite resources. So when I was doing a stint in a kind of a, a lab that wasn't as well funded, you know, we had uh, it was at the bottom of the hill at, at UC Berkeley. And then there's a very steep hill that get <laughs> where the core facility, where the flow cytometer uh, was was at. Mm. So my days would I, I would be running samples up and down this hill <laughs> all like all day, every day. And I really was like there's got to be a better way to do research than having to run samples up and down a hill. Um, and I was, so, I, you know, I went back to my colleagues in the lab and I was like, can we, can we get a cell sorter in the lab? Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time I was like wide eyed, you know, bushy tailed. And I was like, you know, I didn't know how much these things cost. And, you know, the PI was like, you know, that's half a million dollars. Right. And I was like, Oh, that's why we don't have it in the lab. <laughs> that's why we don't have it in the lab. Yeah. Um, and so that really that was when I was like, like the light bulb went off. I was like, the 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 building and solving the problem solving element from like my previous history in gaming really was like, okay, here's a problem that I think is very problematic um for research. And 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 also to add to, I was you know he uh, the, the the PI also mentioned that if this thing breaks down, it's like the repairs are also equally expensive. He basically described it like a Ferrari in a lab. Mm -hmm. It's like if you don't if you don't 
tune it. And if you don't maintain it, it's going to break and it costs an arm and a leg to fix. So that's when the, I think the real, the, the rubber met the road. It's, you know, the entrepreneurship like journey started because we want, I wanted to alleviate that, that burden and that obstacle that was impeding, you know, our lab's ability to, to do research. And mm -hmm. I, you know, obviously I spoke to other labs as well. And I said, is this something that you are experiencing too? And they said, yes, <laughs> <laughs> the well-funded ones, not so much. They're like, we got three of them, <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's where it got her start. But it even makes sense for the well-funded ones to have more capital than to allocate to other things, to studies, for example. Before we dive into your company and your entrepreneurship story deeper, there is one word that you mentioned that made me curious and I want to yep. know more about it. A little bit of a side story at the beginning. Yep. You said you laugh or laughed or laugh playing games. Yep. Uh, so my question is, what are your three favorite games? Okay, so Star uh, Starcraft mm -hmm. is, is up there. Um, uh and this is games broadly speaking mm -hmm. okay starcraft sellers of Catan. Settlers settlers of Catan, of, yeah. yeah but, but settlers this is, of Catan. this is an over the board game isn't it yeah yeah that's a board game so uh, uh growing up our friends and family would would play board games yeah um that was that was a thing that we would do so <laughs> they got started early um and then also um a uh, zelda um was a was another game that i i, I continue to love to this day mm -hmm. um you know zelda had an element of like basically all puzzles <laughs> um starcraft had a lot of head-to-head -head competition and resource management just like tons of it <laughs> um and managing a, a bunch of disparate elements and um the, the board game sellers of Catan is also similar and it's, it's resource management really <laughs> um uh and you know, I, I, I gotta say there's a lot of, <laughs> there, there is, there's a lot of competition <laughs> amongst our friends and we're still friends. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still friends, but I, it, it's gotten heated sometimes. But, but only outside the game. So during the game, you're enemies basically. Com yes. Competitors. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then, you know, after that we break bread. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What yeah. about uh, I heard in other podcasts that uh, in San Francisco, especially uh, billionaire investors love poker. Is this also one of your the, passions? So I have a funny story about that. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm I I love playing poker. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say I'm the best. I'm, I'm decent, um, but my friends all are. They're they tend to like study game theory you know, and are, you know, very much like are, they're kind of like, how would I say they, they're very optimal mm -hmm. in how they play poker. You know, this they're is very the right, optimal. <laughs> yeah, this is the perfect size of the pot. I should, you know, raise the pot this much, whatever, like, you know, they're, they kind of do a decision tree yeah. and are very much optimal. And that's one way to play the game. Um, but I would say my style of poker is I I'll be, I'm not as good at optimizing as they are, but I know when to be like kind of a wild card and just mm -hmm. like these, you know, game theory assumes that everyone is participating in game theory, mm -hmm. but sometimes I'll just go in and just disrupt it. <laughs> and so, yeah. And it pisses them off to no end. They're <laughs> like, why would you do that? That's so irrational. I'm like, that's the point. That's, that's human. Point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the point. Like, um, so Yes. Very much poker is a popular game amongst the event. And it has a lot of similarities to investing, right? It's like, mm. when do you go in and when do you fold? And how hard do you go in? Um, so I think there's a lot of similarities as well, it, you know, when you when you think about the games, comparatively speaking, um, to investing. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think the first podcast I heard about poker in Silicon Valley was Lex Friedman. Uh, mm -hmm. He invited the world champion of poker, and yep. until this, I, I don't play poker, so I played it sometimes in my youth uh, against computers. When it yep. was the '90s, when the first poker games become uh, went online, and it was just for fun. And you always treated it like a fun game. You just uh, bet, and uh, sometimes yep. you bluff, sometimes you don't, and mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you lose some and you win some. 
but I never thought there is a science behind it. And then this world champion, like uh, oh, also yeah. like, similar to you, started yeah. explaining the game theory behind poker. And I loved game theory when I was at the university, when I studied economics. I have still a book yeah. here. So the art of strategy. Yeah. But I never connected it in my mind to poker, to playing poker. And he went mm. deep into that. And after that, Lex Friedman had a podcast with uh, the world champion in playing chess. And he also explained uh, that in chess, there's a lot of game theory in it. So sometimes, as you said, sometimes you just disrupt the opening with an irrational yeah. move to throw off yeah. the opponent. Yeah. Uh, do, do you yeah. like game theory? Yeah, so I, I do like game theory, um, but I think you can get almost too hung up on it. It's <laughs> like, that, that's, you know, in the, you know like an addiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, it almost is like dogma at times. People will take it as dogma. Mm. Um, so I think it's, you know, the world is messy. People are irrational. People, you know, will do things that are not in their best interests. So I think it's, you know, there are certain times when game theory are like really, really applicable. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I think as you get into the world of like business, it becomes more and people will do things that will surprise you all the time, <laughs> like all That's the true. time. So it's, it, it's good to know. It's like a, an arrow in your quiver, um, but shouldn't be the only one. <laughs> Yeah, at some point you think uh, I have seen it all in business and I'm not surprised and then a new person comes <laughs> to the game and yeah. uh, like, I didn't expect that. You, yeah, said, yeah. you, you said earlier that uh, poker is similar to venture investing. Yep. Uh, can you explain it a little bit uh, further? Why, why, you, why you see that? Yeah, that so, so, so po poker, the way I see it, and I, I'm no expert. Um, mm. And if someone's listening that is an expert, forgive me <laughs> if I'm butchering this. Um, but the, you can blame the question on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the poker is similar to investing, generally speaking, is because mm -hmm. when you see an opportunity, right? Like, and this like, so you, you think about Texas Hold'em, um, like as the cards are being revealed, like the odds like are changing, like, and as the odds are changing, you're deciding to increase your investment by raising the pot or you, you know, and let's continue the the analogy here with mm -hmm. venture investing. It's like you can do a follow on round, you can do an up round, or you can do a down round, right? And it's kind of like sizing up the bet, or you know, as the as the circumstances are changing. Um, you know, what are the prospects for this business? I think we're gonna up our bet, right? Mm -hmm. Grow the grow the percentage of our investment. Um, and it's similarly when you're doing that in poker. Um, as the cards are being revealed, the odds are changing, and then you're make, you're you're weighing you're doing a statistical analysis of like okay, what are the odds of this paying out, and then you 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 bet accordingly. Um, but obviously, that that's very you can make optimal bets based on you know you you can you can have like models just running this and running this until someone comes in and just bluffs you, right? <laughs> and right right. So, but you know sometimes that's investing too. People will do irrational things. Um, so that that's why they, uh, there's some similarities to it. Yeah, then uh, it works. Oh, and most... personalities, personalities, like, is very important. <laughs> like, you know, your you know, business is, is it's a relationship game, and it's a person that like it's all about people knowing your personnel. So mm -hmm. poker that way, everyone has their own style, you know, and getting a read on people um, is important. Um, and knowing you know the incentives and the the mindset of the counterparty or your opponent mm -hmm. on that at the poker table is also very important. Same likewise with investing. So it's a lot different playing with new people than with people that you know for a few decades. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And you know, you, you kind of can get a read on the people you've been playing with for a long time. And then mm -hmm. someone new comes in and you're just like, okay, I have zero data on this person. Um I'm just going to, we're going to see how this unfolds. The Europeans that come to Silicon Valley for raising funds and relocating. Yeah. To it, yeah. It's like, you know, it, it, there is definitely similarities, um, mm. which is why I think, you know, gaming, generally speaking, as much it was, you know, early days, like this is a bad habit <laughs> or like, but I don't like, I have a ton of life lessons that, you know, I, I take away. I grew up in the 80s and uh, Austria. 
rural area mountains um basically simple people most of the time even in school um and very focused on getting your daily business done it was just basically the 80s pre-internet times completely different and this was the time when the first gaming computers hit the market and the general perception in society about gaming was very negative so um teachers told my parents uh, your son loves gaming he will become a loner and he will yeah. sit in front of the computer completely alone his entire life. Yeah. You have yeah. to prohibit that gaming is yeah. evil and gaming is bad. Yeah. And it was later, I think it was 10 years or 15 years later, when the first scientific studies came out and said, no, actually, they teach a lot of good lessons to kids. Yeah. Uh, the right games, uh, simulations, for example. Uh, simulation yeah. like was what was in the 90s uh civilization so these building yep. games it's like uh, settlers of Catan is similar but yep. just on a computer what's exactly what, how do you how do you see gaming these days so i i i things have changed mm -hmm. <laughs> things have certainly changed um i don't get to play as much games um as i used to you know uh, but the there's a there's a lot I think there's a lot of great games out there mm. but the internet has really opened up the aperture of like what type of games you know the, the the early days of like PC gaming like Starcraft and stuff you know now the the versions of that like Dota like Dota and everything which are like that on steroids <laughs> um so it's like you know I, I think there are definitely a lot of lessons still to be learned um from gaming um albeit I, I don't play as much as, as I used to. So I, I don't have a professional opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm, I got a little bit in the chest lately, but let's go back to your company and uh, to your upbringing. You said, I mean, one part was gaming and the other part was uh, studying at the University of Berkeley. Berkeley. Yep. And then you had parents um, that basically had a stable job their entire life and you decided to go down the entrepreneurship route found a company which is uh called the hope I spell it right exceder yep exceder 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 yep and how how did your upbringing shape the way you run the company how did it influence yeah. it that that's a great question so i was actually born and raised in berkeley mm -hmm. um and all of my education in Berkeley too. So I haven't really gone that far. Um, now being in San Francisco, it's I'm maybe like 10 miles away. <laughs> yeah, made from where I was born. Um, so the city of Berkeley, California is, I would say very unique, um, has a unique vibe and culture, mm -hmm. which is like, has, have, has left, like it's seared into my DNA. Um, you know, Berkeley is known for like the hippie movement counterculture has cooperatives and communes my favorite pizza place uh cheese board is, is a co-op um mm -hmm. you know but and and everyone's very autonomous you do your own thing um yet you know there's like there's like there's a little bit of a duet like a kind of a paradox to that it's autonomous is it, but cooperative is it is it still a hippie place um it has changed there's yeah. there's the, the demographics have changed um from when i was growing up um but it, the roots, the roots of the city of Berkeley definitely still have it for sure. Um, if, and especially if you get, a, if you kind of start getting away from the UC Berkeley campus and like get to where is more residential, mm -hmm. definitely still has a hippie culture. Um, and, and growing up in Berkeley, you know, I, I, I used to skateboard a lot. I used to go to punk rock shows, played, played games. So I had a very eclectic kind of upbringing, maybe maybe rebellious in some ways, and this is probably why I I went in the direction like career wise that I did. Maybe it was an act of rebellion. Um, <laughs> maybe um, I don't, you know I'll, maybe I won't overly psychoanalyze it, but perhaps it was that. And you know that was kind of like my adolescence, and then going to Berkeley there was like a, a intense, um, like, like amount of rigor and like em embrace of like experimentation at Berkeley. Um, and, you know, it was very much okay to take risks and fail as long as, you know, you learn from your mistakes, but 
that said, it wasn't a a thing where, you know, UC Berkeley was, it was sink or swim. Like you're taking the risk and you're going to bear the brunt of the consequences. Um, but you, that's how you learn the hard way. Um, mm-hmm. And you'll, you'll never forget those lessons. Um, and you get stronger the next go around. So that's kind of like the kind of the culture of UC Berkeley as an institution. Um, and I would even say this kind of extends broadly to the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. Um, there's a lot of experimentation and just kind of like risk taking. Um, and, you know, now when I think about how that kind of has impacted Exceder and how that has like kind of influenced my kind of like kind of, I guess, style and our style is, you know, we continue to really embrace like rigorous experimentation. Um, you know, anyone at the company can run their own A-B test and to see if there's a better way of doing things. I'm not beholden to any one way of doing something. If there's something that's better, let's test it out. Um, you know, I don't think there's one right way to do anything. And another thing is like kind of like challenging the status quo, um, like that culture of just like asking why, like why do we do these things is important. And mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, definitely part of the Berkeley upbringing. Um, you know, leasing, Exceder does equipment leases, you know, leasing is an age old industry, but we're still continuing to find clever ways to do it differently. Um, and, you know, there's an element of like autonomy and collaboration within Exceder where everyone has autonomy over their domain, but continues to collaborate with each other. Kind of like what I was saying, like, you know, there's Berkeley has co-ops, but people are very much do their own thing. And so it's the kind of this weird duality. Mm-hmm. But it, it, what it results in is like a lot of like one plus one equals five outcomes, which is fantastic. Um, and then the kind of the last thing I would say is that we're always looking for positive sum or like win-win situations. So we're always looking to grow the pie rather than just trying to extract value and to split the pie. Um, so we're always looking ways like how can we bring value to all stakeholders here, mm-hmm. vendors, customers, employees, the community. Um, every time we make a decision. So I, I realize that sounds very kind of chaotic and eclectic, um, but it, it's, it's worked well for, for us um, and, you know, and keeps everyone energized um, and keeps me, you know, I'm, I'm pumped up to get to, you know, get to work every day. Now, if you're a conductor, if you want to disrupt things, you have to play trial and error and yeah. try, try to find better ways to do things rather than continuing down the old route and complain about yeah, things yeah. not working. <laughs> It's risky. Some things will fail. I mean, I, um, currently I read the biography of Tim Cook. So all big companies that I'm aware of, Apple, Amazon, Google, Alphabet, Tesla, they all have their stories of failure. But yep. I think these are necessary to find the few things that really work then. Yep. Uh, I, I'm curious about, about your career. So you grew up in Berkeley. You studied in Berkeley. Uh, you graduated from the university. Yep. And then you decided to start your company or was there a step in between that you tasted the, the, the smell of secure and safe jobs in the industry? Yeah. So there, I was a, there was a very short stint where I mm. worked at a law firm. Oh, fo- yeah. Where at, at, at a law firm. Yeah. How that? How, how that? Yeah. It, but it was a sign. It was a science focused law firm. Mm that that handle a lot of scientific work in cases um and you know this was like before i found my love for wet lab research i was like trying to figure it out i was like i, I knew i i knew i wanted to be in the sciences but in mm-hmm. what shape or form i wasn't quite sure um so i you know at one point in time you know it, the very first you know and this is not novel in any way but like when I was first getting to university, it was like, okay, maybe I'll be a doctor. <laughs> That's science. Um, di- didn't want to do that. Um, wasn't a fit. And then I was like, okay. And maybe this is before like I went full rebellious because like stability of like a doctor. And I was like, okay, maybe a lawyer, but I still want to be in science. So like, mm-hmm. I'll try that out. And that was like the, a brief taste of stability. And it just was not my style. <laughs> like, was not my style um and 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 you know 
to each their own. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but I just, it didn't really, uh, I didn't find as much energy as I, I, as I wanted to. So after that short stint went, just dove right into wet lab research. And then within the, the lab ecosystem kind mm -hmm. of spun exceeder out of that experience. And the labs were part of the university. Yep. Berkeley. Why, why not the academic crowd? I mean, uh, your parents probably would have appreciated yeah, it. Yes, they would have loved it. Um, <laughs> the academic, I think the academic route was, well, I, I always saw it as like becoming a professor is like harder than getting into the NBA, like <laughs> to play basketball. Yeah, it's Berkeley um, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like harder than the NBA. And mm -hmm. You know, the <laughs> when I saw the statistics of who ends up becoming professors, especially those that are tenured, mm. I was like, there's a lot of better basketball players or like academics than me. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, and so I think the <laughs> that's an exceeder uh, is kind of, you know, despite us not, you know, you know, we're playing, we're, we're playing a supportive role. For, mm. for those in research, whether it be academia, for-profit, early stage, late stage, um, we're still very, very much involved um, with every, and, you know, obviously life science academia plays hand in hand with, you know, industry as well. A lot of the technologies derive from academia. So, you know, we're, we're still playing our part, but, you know, when, you know, <laughs> Draymond Green, Steph Curry are on the court, we'll let them do their thing. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play, we'll do ours. Um, I'm curious now. You you are in the lab, and you said you had to run up and down the hill to yep. to deliver thing. And then at one point you had the idea, uh, why not leasing? So basically, you saw the problem. Uh, you had an idea about the solution, and what happened then? Because I mean, many people see problems and then go out on the market, see a solution, uh, like. Uh, leasing stuff i mean they're leasing companies out there already uh yep. so why did you decide then I really want to, to dissect a little bit this moment of uh yep. revelation that there is a, a, a yeah a, probably a bigger game going on or a bigger pie that you can uh, can dive yeah. into uh instead of just calling a, a leasing firm and say hey can you can you get us this at a decent price why did you decide yeah. to found a company yeah i think There, there's a little bit, you know, it's been a, you know, or if I turn back the hands of time and think about mm -hmm. what mine, like kind of the mind state I was in back then, I was probably a little bit naive, you know, I, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and that might've been a benefit, honestly, mm -hmm. if I knew all of the intricacies of this <laughs> up front, maybe I would have been a professor <laughs> or tried to be <laughs> right. Maybe I, I took, I would have taken a different career path. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, my, from what, I think what makes us special is that we only specialize and do like scientific lab equipment. Mm -hmm. That's all we do. Um, we know the labs really well. We know the equipment really well. We know the industry really well. It was basically, I'm selling to myself or former self. Mm -hmm. I was like scratching my own itch. And so I knew that we could do it better than you know a large financial institution who who simply thinks of a researcher as just a number in a spreadsheet mm -hmm. frankly that's what a you know jb morgan as much as you know as they you know as large as they are they they probably have you as a number in a spreadsheet somewhere yeah. um so you, so yeah no go ahead go ahead oh no no yeah that, i'll just say, you know that that was you know we one we thought we can do it better um, mm -hmm. We're selling to our 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 colleagues, um, and two the the repair and maintenance component is is a big differentiator. Um, we when something breaks down during the lease, we make sure it gets repaired or main, and maintained for the duration of the term to make sure there's no you know for example if if you have a big research milestone coming up you know that you need to what if you need to present at a conference present to investors submit you know to the FDA that's a real deadline. Mm -hmm. If your flow cytometer breaks, they don't care. <laughs> like <laughs> they, they do not care. Um, so Absolutely. there's an element of one, you know, 
there's the leasing component of us mm-hmm. being able to get equipment in the hands of researchers better than you know what's out there because of our intimate knowledge of it. Mm-hmm. And two, also making sure that these instruments are running at their best. So in the case you have a critical deadline coming up, you don't miss a beat, even if there was, you know, un, you know, hopefully, God forbid, a breakdown. But um, th- that was the kind of, I would say back then, the kind of the key insights and, you know, working it out um, and just kind of like testing. A lot, there was a lot of testing on how this kind of would be formulated. Um, mm-hmm. And it was until we, you know, it took a while to get the product market fit. Um, but once, you know, once it was there, we we're off to the races. So your company focuses basically on biotech life science. Uh, That's correct. And geographically, it's just just Silicon Valley. Or do you also uh, support uh, scientists, uh, researchers, and uh, early stage companies uh, all over the United States? All over the United States. Um, so that, you know, that has been, you know, we're very proud of that, that we, we mm-hmm. pretty much operate in all the states. Um, yeah. And, you know, but obviously there's concentrations around the kind of like hotbeds mm-hmm. um, of uh, kind of universities. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is definitely, you know, kind of our focus is like serving the, the U.S. community and, you know, kind of arming the rebels, like getting, <laughs> the equipment, the rebel, yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting the equipment into the hands of the researchers that need it. Um, because I always think back on that experience, you know of being in the lab that wasn't as well funded. It's like, we were doing great research, mm. but we just like couldn't move at the pace that we wanted to mm. because I was running, I had to run up and down the hill. <laughs> I was like slowing but, things down. But it's so. good, it's good training. It's good for your health. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had great cardio, <laughs> like yeah. great cardio. <laughs> um, I was, I was, you know, in, I was in fit shape, that's for sure. <laughs> so basically your company takes on the big guys, JP Morgan, like JP Morgan, for example. Um, And you can help uh, other startups to take on their big guys uh, in their industries um, and help them with a speedy process to their lab equipment. You replace, you repair it. What about conquering the world? What about leaving the United States and uh, coming to Europe and Asia? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we at Exceder, we, if we're going to do something, we want to do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have a very high bar like a high standard for ourselves and our product. Um, and, and this is definitely something that we've looked into. Um, and we're starting to, you know, have more for, for formal motions into a international um, expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, it is, it is, I know if I'm, if I'm looking even farther out, it's definitely going to happen. Um, but the, the timing of when, um, is the the question mark for us yeah um and and the, the the question of when is because we just want to be able to do it right um mm-hmm. we don't we don't want to roll something out half-baked and have it and you know have the lab have a bad experience we want every you know, we want the same you know kind of experience the high quality experience that those labs that work with us in the united states we want that for every country any country that we we can go into mm-hmm. and obviously there's a lot of also like you know regulatory nuances tax legal um so there's like the actual like mechanics of it but we always want to make sure that we we hold ourselves to that standard but it is it is on the roadmap and it, i think it's an inevitable future for us if you are looking for challenges in different jurisdictions europe is the right place to be you will <laughs> have a lot of fun <laughs> yeah yeah i was we, we were doing some preliminary research i was like oh boy <laughs> like, I was like, okay, one, there's a massive time difference. Two, just like, oh boy, like there's <laughs> a lot of intricacy here. <laughs> like, like, and you know, it, it seemed that like there was just so like there's very fine nuances between every you know every region. You have so different lots cultures, of homework. different yeah. languages, different legal systems, sometimes different currencies. Yeah. Uh, very small countries like Austria, uh, 9 million inhabitants. Then you have the Czech Republic, completely different language with uh, about 10 million inhabitants. And this is just, uh, I mean, it's a, the European game is, a, is one of the most complicated games that you can play. So this yeah. makes it, this makes it interesting, but there are, there are good ecosystems here for, for, yeah. for leasing, I, I suppose. Uh, let's, let's go back to Berkeley. Uh, I have a few yep. questions. 
um, for the ecosystem. So you founded your company, you started your first company in Berkeley, and then you served other startups and also experienced other ecosystems in the United States. Uh, yeah. What makes the area around Berkeley so special? How helpful are they for entrepreneurs? Yeah, so my experience might be dated at this point. Um, when I was getting started, Berkeley actually didn't really have like a, a formal entrepreneurship program. It was actually like a very, it was not a popular career path at that yet. Like, you know, and this, you know, it was actually kind of frowned upon. I, I actually remember some taking some early meetings as I was kind of like surveying the campus Mm -hmm. um, where I was like getting kicked out of like professors, like offices, because I had, you know, the gall of talking about Exceder and a, and a potential business opportunity. Oh, really? We are, we are talking about uh, 2010 around this time, 2010, yep. 11, 11 ish. Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. I always and thought everybody loves entrepreneurship in the, in, in the United States. Academia. Has it's very stereotypical. <laughs> yeah. Acad academ Stan Stanford at that time. Mm -hmm embraced it okay like very much embraced it i think berkeley was a little bit later um but like was but just just for just for me as an austrian i mean uh when i look at google maps it looks very close stanford and berkeley and this was such a huge cultural gap yeah oh huge I know that. Mm -hmm. yeah huge um you know and, and and i guess part of that is like you know Ber the uc system it, it's a you know, it's a, it's a public research institution. Mm -hmm. um, so there was probably, you know, some, you know, intricacies compared to an institution like Stanford, which is a private university. Um, so there's like, there's, de there's definitely different cultural norms. And I'll, I'll say that like, you know, this was wait, this was a while ago, right? So things have changed, you know, mm -hmm. Berkeley definitely now, like, and it was, you know, 2010, that was like when Uber was just getting started and Airbnb was like, just getting started right so like entrepreneurship had yet yeah. to become like kind of like in the in the mainstream and so it was kind of like that you either go into big pharma or you become a professor that mm -hmm. was kind of the track um so it was kind of weird when i had you know i I, I i definitely felt weird this is true and it was still the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2007 yes. 2008 yes. um Interest rates were about going down, but not yep. yet really down. Not yet. Europe was almost failing financially, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. It was a different time. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's true. It was a very, very different time. Um, and, you know, you fast forward to now and Berkeley is doing a lot to embrace entrepreneurship. You mm -hmm. know, classes, they have their own accelerator, incubator programs, training programs, mentorships, like industry collaborations internship opportunities like if you want to work at a startup and get a feel of what a startup is like berkeley will help you they'll place you like that like you know it, it's 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 like now it's like this is a very viable track and berkeley is investing heavily in it um but for us you know we're getting started it was like me and my co-founder just like baptism of fire just like you know figure it out and like and you know the it was really really painful in that way um but there's so many lessons that we still carry to this day from from having to go through that that trial um you know and you know the and i would say even back then the venture community wasn't as developed um you know entrepreneurship as a concept was still kind of new um for biotech um you know your, a lot of the r d was taking place in big pharma and so you know, for my co-founder and I, you know, we, we bootstrapped the thing. So when we put our life savings into Exceder, you know, it really, really forces you to think long and hard about every decision you make, right? When it's the, it's going to either make the difference of like, can I pay rent or <laughs> not pay rent, right? It's, oh, a very, yeah. it's a very, the weight of it is, is very real. Um, and that's kind of resulted in kind of this culture of like efficiency and focusing on how to be creative within these constraints within Exceder mm -hmm. um, that I think, you know, benefits us to this day. So you bootstrapped your company without the help of venture capital. That's correct. And you put your entire life savings back then yeah. on you, you the line. Imagine, yeah. You can imagine my parents were not happy about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can. I can. My, my mother is not so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my parents were not happy about that. 
um, you know, there are definitely some scary times. Um, but, you know, like, I, I think, you know, I, I, I also don't think our business is like a, is a venture business, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, we're, we're, we're very different in that way, but yeah, it's, you know, it, the, the, the kind of the bootstrapped beginnings, um, and we're still bootstrapped. Um, it, it, it has, it influences the culture a lot. So um, you and you and your founding partner still own hundred percent of the company and didn't give any equity away to private equity companies or venture capitalists or on the public market to other investment firms. That, yeah, that's correct. That's that's impressive. I mean, it's it's the, basically the way I learned uh, back in the nineties and eighties how to start companies: look for customers first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. And I, I joke about this, but it's kind of real. It's like our investors are our customers. Yeah. Like, right. You're just like find customers who find value in what you do and are willing to pay you for it. Um, yeah. and if the more value you bring to them, the more they're willing to pay you. <laughs> um, and the, I think that was, you know, obviously in the very beginning, it was finding the first customer was painstakingly hard, like so hard. I was a scientist. I didn't know how to do sales. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I had maybe one like set of clothes that I thought was business appropriate, mm -hmm. just an ill-fitting suit and like <laughs> wrinkled and just like, I would actually do like door-to-door -door sales that mm -hmm. like, I would go and like knock on doors of labs and see if I, <laughs> I thought that's what sales was. I, I mm -hmm. guess it still kind of is, but you know, it, those are the early days is like really actually just like driving around the Bay area looking for customers. Um, But it's scrap is that scrappiness that I think that uh, you know we we still kind of embrace. So you are the Grant Cardone and Gary Vaynerchuk of the life science industry, basically. So you've <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. I I mean they're 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 you know they're doing their thing on a much larger yeah, grander yeah, scale. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean I I I didn't know better, right? Mm. It's like you know I think I was talking about this earlier. Um, you don't know what you don't know, and I think part and you don't want to get hung up like as a founder, it, it can be problematic to get hung up on what has been like over-researching and, you know, getting hung up on what's been done in the past. And like this problem is solved mm -hmm. because I think having a little bit of that ignorance or naivete can benefit you as a founder oh, because true. it makes impossible problems, impossible problems feel possible. And then you strive for that. I mean, you didn't have a commercial training at Berkeley, so molecular toxicology. How did you flip the switch in your mind to go chasing customers instead uh, <laughs> of not chasing customers? <laughs> yeah, so my 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 co-founder actually comes from finance, so mm -hmm. he we we he he's actually you know has a deep finance background, and so he kind of kicked me in the butt and said, <laughs> "Get to it." Mm -hmm. go start doing some sales i'm like what do you mean <laughs> he's like you just figure it out and so that i gotta say it, it came from him jeff you know mm -hmm. really kicked me in the butt to do it um and you know and there was so many like sales is like is like a science as mm -hmm. much as it is an art as well um so mm -hmm. applying the kind of the rigor of wet lab research and applying it to sales um, is is very applicable as much as they feel like very disparate fields you, you can get very scientific with sales as well um so i think as much as you know it was i was unfamiliar with it i just needed that kick in the butt just like to go do it and then you know just basically applied you know kind of the training that i had in you know academia and just applied it to sales um and you know and just kind of continue to iterate from there I'm curious now, you have a co-founder who he's from finance, he has a finance background. How yep. did you bridge the gap between science and finance? Uh, particularly here in Europe, I often experience that uh, scientists and business people seem to have sometimes a hard time to get along that together. Uh, how did you bridge the gap in your company? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, Maybe it is the Berkeley upbringing where we're all like kind of the co-op mentality where we're all in this together equally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I like to joke that as much as Jeff 
kicked me in the butt to, you know, to focus on business and finance. I also imparted on him an appreciation for science and like via osmosis, he's like an honorary biochemist now. <laughs> like <laughs> it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you know, we, before being co-founders, we were longtime friends. Um, and so they, we had a, we very much respect each other and our own kind of like domains and disciplines and having that respect for each other. And I think in the sciences, you know, it can be very easy to say that the success of a scientific endeavor is purely the science, mm -hmm. but I, I disagree. Um, and, you know, I might get beat up for this on the internet, but it's okay. Um, you know, it's more kicks, an, it's more kicks then, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And I, I think one, you know, communicating the science is very mm -hmm. important, right? This is like reading, writing, like being able to verbalize and communicate the science is very important. That's not the science itself, right? It's like, how do you, how do you interact with people? You know, the finance aspect, it's like, how do we keep the lights on? Like if your lab does like, you know, if you can't run your lab and you can't pay the bills and, you know, PG and E or, you know, they're turning off the lights on you, the science comes to a grinding halt. So I think the, me and my co-founder at, at Exceder, we very much embrace the mentality that it takes a village to, to get it done, especially in the sciences, whether it's you're in marketing operations, legal finance, or you're in the science side and technology everyone comes together. And when you work together, magic happens. Um, and I always think it's like a little miracle when, when something gets through the clinic, right? But it's, it's, it's a getting through the clinic is no small feat. And but it takes, it takes so many people, and so many stakeholders. Um, and so that's why I think me and my co founder, we, we agree on this, we agree on this. And I think that's super important for co founders. You know, when you're finding your, your counterpart, mm -hmm. that you know, you're not butting heads and yeah. we, we, you know, we are, we have healthy disagreements, mm. but we, we end up coming to a happy medium um, and pushes it forward. And sometimes you can drink a beer together. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and just, and just hang out and just like yeah. have fun. Like that's another aspect of it too. It's like, don't, don't, you know, there's, there's a lot to life and, you know, enjoy it. So it's great for you. Is it John and Jeff then? It's uh, Jay yep. and Jay. Chain yep, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, with the new Chain Chain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the next yeah, yeah, Chain yeah. Chain, the next Chain Chain. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you found your co-founder. It's a, a long-term friend. Uh, you respect him. He respects you. You start working together, and then he kicks you in the butt and say you yeah. need to go selling. And yeah. I mean, the perfect sale is always the easygoing. You go to a lab. I can also imagine in your life, you go to a customer. Uh, he immediately loves what you do. He loves your service. He loves what you have to offer and say, let me sign and let me triple the price. I like yeah. you so much. It's perfect. But uh, my experience, 90% of the sales encounters are not going that way. There is a lot of rejection in it. What's your yes. secret to deal with rejection? It still hurts. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't think you ever stop feeling like the pain of rejection. Um, but I think over time the feeling isn't as like it isn't as acute or as visceral as the more repetitions you get in so there's an that, there's like a there's a there's the motion and the mechanism like kind of just like doing it enough where you become a, somewhat accustomed to it there, there's an element of that that it's just like pure grit I, I won't sugarcoat it like mm -hmm. you you kind of just have to grit it out a little bit um but what makes I guess for me, the what what kind of drives me to grit it out and and kind of just like get through it is because at the end of the day, where Exceder's mission is to serve the scientific community and improve health outcomes for all. Mm -hmm. And if I give up now, we are not going to we're not going to be able to achieve that mission, and we're not going to be able to get the equipment in the hands of these researchers who are making, you know, life change, conducting life changing research, right? So there's the element of having a mission that you truly believe in, which makes the rejection worthwhile. And it still sucks. Like when it really is not fun, 
but, and you, you'll get rejected and it hurts, but you know, it is all worth it in the end as you're striving to achieve your goal. That's, that's a good statement. So having a sound mission, so a North star that you yep. can look towards when, when it's been, when, when selling hurts. <laughs> yes. Selling hurts. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, 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 you know, everyone's, everyone's mission is going to be different. Um, mm -hmm. but it's finding what's, what's right for you and your, your team and your org. Um, and this is right for us. Um, and everyone else has, you know, a different mission. Um, but being able to rally behind it, I think is really important because it makes, it, it makes it in, in just, not in just rejection, but just when things are, things go up, things go down. And when things go down, things get rough and you want, you know, <laughs> If you if you still want to be around, you need to grit it out, and it makes it a little bit easier knowing that it's all going to be worth it. How do you define selling? What is what 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 is the definition at uh, your company? Yeah, so selling for us really it's more of like an it's more like education. Mm -hmm. It's the and and you know this took a lot of time to figure out how to communicate this um, as you know leasing and finance is kind of like a more foreign concept for, for scientific laboratories. Um, so it's education and like problem solving um, and like raising awareness, right? You know, I knew there was a problem because I, I experienced that exact problem. So I knew it was there. <laughs> like, so it's, it's first like raising awareness, mm -hmm. like, hey, like, you know, we, we were in your shoes, we, we know these, these are kind of the hangups of, you know, the status quo is to always buy equipment. And I know that really can really hurt the budget. And so identifying and aware, uh, bringing awareness to the problem um, and then educating them. Like there is a kind of a, there is a solution to this. So there's an education element to that. Um, and then obviously the one aspect that's different is like every lab is, is unique. And then if at that point it's like, customizing the solution to fit their needs because not one solution fits everybody so it's like awareness education and then kind of like customization based on the unique circumstances of the the end user um and when you combine those things and you communicate it well it tends to to work out in in sales and mm -hmm. um but you have to like again you're not going to get it right every, on the first stop on the first try you have to like continue to iterate and because, you know, you, you, you'll try it once, they're going to hang up the phone, go try again, <laughs> and then see if you can improve the next go around. Um, and, and, and yeah, it takes a long time to get that, that muscle. But once you do, um, you know, there's, there's no better feeling than when, it, when, when you're on the phone with someone and you just see that it clicks. So when people fail in business, I mean, mostly they fail in se with selling. And uh, where my opinion is very often they just uh, give up after the first no. So there is a person, they meet this person or call this person or write an email and get the rejection back. And then say, okay, this is a clear no. <laughs> he or yeah, she doesn't yeah. want and I don't follow up. And then there is this other group of people that I experience very often on LinkedIn uh, yeah. who just keep chasing and send one yeah. email after the other. Uh, yeah. how, how do you handle this uh, 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 going back to potential customers, going back to prospects and yep. not giving the feeling that you chase them down <laughs> until they yeah. say yes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you obviously want to be, you know, you want to be graceful and mm -hmm. like you want to be, you, know, you, you don't want to be a, a, an utter like annoyance, right? So always try to be valuable like provide value. Mm. Like don't just try to take, you you got to give, right? And so in my perspective, like giving, like providing value to whoever you're trying to speak to is first and foremost, like what you need to do. Um, whether that be, you know, on, on the sales side, you know, it's, you know, from our perspective, it's, you know, people find out about us at, you know, all over the place on the internet or in, in person. And, you know, especially on the internet, it's easy to just like, you know, click send, just like annoy, annoy people. It's very like low effort, mm. but we try our best to actually provide something of value to whoever we're reaching out to for their unique circumstances. We try to do as much research as we can 
on, on the specific, you know, potential lab that we want to work with and see if we can provide value to them, customized to them. Um, and, and sometimes it, you know, it, it, it doesn't work out and that's okay. But the, if you're in doing sales, you need to put in the work to provide value to whoever you're reaching out to real value, not, not just like, don't just go through the motions. You got to actually provide value, whatever that may be. And that, that to be defined by your organization, but as long as you provide value and, you know, sometimes I get it too on mine and sometimes I'll open a DM and I was like, oh, that was incredibly valuable. Yes. I'll have a, I'll have a phone call with you, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if it's something just like, Hey, I'm just following up. Hey, I'm just following up. Hey, I'm just following up. That's not valuable. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, you're just following up. Um, you're, you know, you're just adding to the, the, the tons of notification red dot on my, on my phone. Um, that's <laughs> it's, not valuable. It's two weeks since our last communication. Here is my follow up mail. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I guess. So I, I always be valuable, yeah. whatever that, and you have to define that for yourself and you have to define that mm -hmm. for your org and do the work and do the research. Um, and then you, you'll, and find creative ways to provide value. And then mm -hmm. that will reduce the likelihood of rejection I mean, in, in as, our experience. As, as you said, uh, selling is an art and the science by itself. Um, yep. but how, how, do you, how do you define for you the fine line when you say, I stop here? I don't pursue the prospect further because you said providing value. I mean, uh, and it's one principle and the other principle you mentioned is win-win. So yep. providing value sometimes can end up in a situation where people just take yep. and say, okay, of course you can lease us equipment to us, but we don't want to pay. And of course it would be some sort of value that you provide the equipment that you yeah. say you don't have to pay. So we yeah, have yeah, yeah, yeah. as a customer. How do you define the line when you say, uh, okay, no, I stop here because it's too much coming from my side and I'm being ripped off. Yeah. And that, you know, for, for, uh, for leasing, you know, generally speaking, there's like a, a hard number, like, you know, like if, if a piece of equipment is a hundred thousand dollars, we need to make more than a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars during the duration of the lease mm -hmm. at a minimum, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, we, it can't be $90,000. Like, okay, well, we just gave it to you at a discount and also gave you five years of financing. Right. But it, like, would, but it would be value and a win for the customer. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for us, you know, we're just hemorrhaging cash and then maybe we can't keep the lights on. Right. Um, because again, we don't have, we don't have outside investment, you mm -hmm. know, the money that customers pay us go towards keeping the lights on paying for the internet, th these mm -hmm. kinds of things. Right. And so I think when it comes to these like win-win scenarios and just being stakeholder focused, it's, and I, I don't have a hard number, but it's like, you want both people and parties to feel like they came out with a good deal, but not a mm. steal, right? One mm. person can't feel like they got a steal because that means that the, the other side, they, they're, they're, they've taken a loss, mm. right? So the win-win is where it's like, oh, this is good. I'm not like ecstatic about it. Like where, oh, like I got 90% of the pot and you got 10, right? It's there's somewhere in, it's like, that's where it's kind of like an art. It's like somewhere in the middle where both of you come out happy but not necessarily ecstatic and this builds for long-term relationships where mm. re you come back you're like yeah i would definitely do that again because business is a long game and it's a relationship game and you can you can profit max maximize if you want mm. and extract as much value from the transaction but that's very in my opinion very short-sighted because they won't want to work with you the next time and it's very, and knowing that if you're, you know, for us, our horizon for Exceder is like, I want Exceder to live beyond me. I want this to be a generational company, you know, hundred plus years and extracting value and burning a customer, burning a vendor is not a way to build for that hundred year journey for, for Exceder. So we're very focused on building for the long term and finding that win-win where someone wants to do repeat business with us um, and, and doesn't feel like it's like they, they got the, the pie was 90% exceeder, 10% them or vice versa. Like, you know, sometimes this happens to us and, you know, where, you know, there's kind of a win loss scenario and 
it doesn't sit well. And, you know, but yeah, yes, it profit maximizes in the short term, but it jeopardizes the relationship in the long term. Yeah, business is interesting because there's so many different people on the market. I mean, when I just think about this is one scenario, win-win, then uh, I always call it the Russian way. Um, there are people on the market uh, who simply don't care. So it's just about them. They love winning and they don't care about other people losing. And then you have also the opposite side that uh, there are some people on the market who will always be in the losing position because they don't care about winning. <laughs> so uh, when you bring these three parties together, you have interesting combinations. I mean, the win-win people always get along well together. Uh, yeah. When you put the win-win person or a person with a win-win mindset together with a win-loss mindset, it can be very interesting. Uh, yeah. It can be very abusive when you put a person with a loss mindset together with a win-loss person. How do yeah. you deal in your company and with uh, when you look at your supply and customer side with these different mindsets on the market? So win-loss and loss-loss mindsets. Yeah. So from our perspective, and this is, again, I'll mm. speak for Exceder, um, mm. but I won't speak for other businesses. I don't think there's one right way to do business. Like there's a million ways to make a million bucks. <laughs> and we choose to make our living this way. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, everyone has a finite time on earth, you know, and we want to live our life this way. And if someone else wants to live their life that way and conduct business that way, I won't stop them. Mm -hmm. Right. It is, it is your prerogative, but from our perspective, a worth life living is finding the win-win situations and it's more fun that way in our opinion, it's fun. Like it's fun to find a win-win. And I just don't want to do business. You know, if I'm on my deathbed and just thinking about all the losers in the wake of destruction that I've left mm -hmm. that, that, that for me personally, it depresses me. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I'm not making a judgment call on anyone because like some, some people have their own scorecards and measure success differently. Um, but for us, and, and perhaps for Exceder, that doesn't mean there's like, you know, uh, we're not going to be the biggest, you know, we're not the next Amazon or Google, right? You don't get that big unless you step on some heads and create some losers, mm -hmm. right? So, and that, and that's okay for us. Like we're not, we're not looking for world domination. We're not, you know, we're all we're looking for is to serve the scientific community mm -hmm. the best we can, like that's the best, the best we can, whatever size of company that is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But as long as we're serving the scientific community the best we can, that makes everyone at Exceder happy. And I think sets us up for long-term success um, and longevity. I like this attitude, but it also means then that sometimes you can't do business with people who have a different mindset. So sometimes it's just not a good fit. It's just the right oh, yeah. understanding. And we, 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 we turn business away mm -hmm. um, um, because it's not, a, it's not a good fit. And that's okay. Like, I, I think that's one aspect of sales that I had to learn the hard way. In the very beginning, I try to say yes to everything because, you know, getting your first customer is so critically important, right? Mm. But the, I learned the hard way is that I found some customers that weren't a good fit. They had a win-loss mindset. I had a win-win mindset ultimately, but I said yes to it. And when you sign up for a lease, that is five years long, that's going to be a long five years. Mm -hmm. um, you have to work with this. There's a contractual obligation to work with this person for five years. Mm -hmm. And I learned the hard way. I got, you know, a lot of anxiety, sleepless nights, you know, just, it wasn't, I, you know, you know, we, we basically, at, you know, we, we let people down with grace. We'd say like, we don't think it's a good fit here, but, and we'll make suggestions. Like we'll make, We'll, we'll try and find a solution that might be a better fit for them if it's not Exceder. Mm -hmm. And that's totally okay, in, in our opinion. Like, we're a right solution for a, a specific subset of people. Um, and there's another, if, for, if it's not a fit with us, we're going to do our best to help you find a solution that's a good fit for you. How is that for you? I mean, um, you say you want to serve the lab community. You want to serve yep. scientists and want to help them solve their problems. Yep. And sometimes you have to say no. How is it yep. for you? It hurts. It, it's never a good feeling. Mm -hmm. um, it's never a good feeling. And, you know, I, I, I would say that fortunately, I, I really, you know, 
the scientific community is a great community. I think it's why I fall, I fall in love with the scientific community and that wet lab research is because of this mentality. It, everyone knows that science is hard. Mm-hmm. Like it's some of the hardest problems that we're, you know, that we're trying to solve. It's mother nature, <laughs> um, right? It's hard and it takes a team, it takes a village. And so more often than not, people are looking for win-wins as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I perhaps, you know, I, I'll, I'll rib my, my co-founder, Jeff, you know, who comes from a finance background. Sometimes finance is known to have win, like Wall Street is known for win-loss. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that makes sense because like if you're trading, if you're making trades on the public exchange, you're, you're, the act of making the trade is basically a win-loss scenario. Someone on the other side has to be willing to sell to you at a lower amount so you can, you know, so it's right. There's an imbalance, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Someone's selling low, buying high. Someone's buying low, selling high, right? So, you know, Wall Street tends to foster that kind of mentality. And I'm not saying everyone in Wall Street's that way, but it's the, me- it's the mechanics of the industry that tends to form the, the zeitgeist. Whereas with science, it's like, okay, how do we cure cancer? It's like, oh, cancer is very complex and hard. I need to loop in like, like my x-ray crystallographer, my comp bio person, you know, just like literally just bring in like as many people from different disciplines as, like as, as much as possible. Let's try and figure this out. Like, how are we going to finance this thing? Oh, we need, you know, we need, cap- we need the capital markets to participate. We need legal to participate, mm-hmm. intellectual property. Everybody comes in, comes together, trying to solve this one hard, super hard problem, right? And so the zeitgeist of life sciences tends to be communal in that sense. So when we, you know, knock on wood, when we do sales, more often than not, it's a fit. But sometimes there isn't, and that's okay. And we, we try to let them down with grace and try to offer an alternative that would be a better fit. That's a good attitude. I always smile when uh, Americans use German words like zeitgeist. <laughs> so it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I hopefully I you know, pronounce it the right way. <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's oh, yeah. great to hear sometimes German words in, a, in our conversation. Um, yeah. You are now, let me, t- I hope you calculated it right, uh, 2011 started your company. Mm-hmm. Now we have 2023 and I don't think the next slope. So it's uh, 12, 12, 12 years. Yes, 12 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, and then you decided to start a podcast. Yeah. I mean, you have a, you have a well-running business. And how do you see that your podcast supports your business or is this a completely separate entity from your company? So the Biotech Startups podcast was, you know, really the goal of it was to is to educate the next generation Mm -hmm. of scientific entrepreneurs and also educate those that are already on that journey Mm -hmm. and honestly it was it's just something that i wish i had when i was starting Mm -hmm. um so i could like you know basically have a, a a kind of a entrepreneur starter kit so I wouldn't have to like hit my head on the wall, like as much trying to figure out very like things that, you know, could have been solved much quicker. Um, so it's trying to accelerate that, right? Because I know coming out of the lab, you know, you're, when you're in the lab in academia, you are heads down, research, research, research. You don't, on your free time, I'm going to guess you don't know what HR is. You, you didn't, you, you didn't learn about fundraising you didn't learn about you know lab ops well perhaps lab ops actually because you're running your lab perhaps you didn't know about intellectual property you know what you you know how all sales and marketing right like all of these things you don't rightfully you don't have time when you're in your your graduate studies so our goal was to just basically (laughs) again scratching my own itch or maybe my former itch Mm -hmm. it's uh trying to teach as many people as we can um, and kind of demystify the, you know, entrepreneurship is hard and it's often a black box and we're just trying to demystify it and also show that there are plenty of ways to build a business in your own style. I couldn't agree more. It was just uh, 
running through my mind while you were speaking. It's a uh, similar attitudes that I have with my podcast. I mean, I think back to the 80s when I said I would like to start businesses and the environment was like your parents' environment. I mean, it was yeah. all about get a job, <laughs> finish yeah. your education, <laughs> yeah. get a job and then build a house, have kids and then yeah. sometime in the future retire, but you never leave your job. <laughs> you stay in your yes. company. Yes. And the first, the first things that I found very helpful were these uh, business business games that started somewhere in the 80s with uh, Commodore DC 64 was a yep. computer uh, famous here in, 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 in Central Europe. Then came the Windows computers with better simulations. Um, then I started uh, business economy, economy, business management at the University of Graz. And there I found the Harvard business cases. And I really love this, uh, this attitude that they said, look, I mean, we are not looking for laws in economy. Some things will work in certain environments, uh, but don't work in other environments. So what we do is, was my understanding back then and still is now about these business cases is uh, we identify the success criteria and describe the story, the circumstances in under which circumstances they worked and everybody can read it. And can then decide, uh, I take this part or I throw it away. It doesn't work in my environment, but it's not like a law. And I always thought it would be nice to put this attitude, uh, define business cases to the next level. And I think podcasting, video podcasts are this next level. So yep. we can now engage, or I can now engage with people like you. You run your company in uh, Silicon Valley or in San Francisco in the Bay Area. I'm here in Austria and I can ask you questions about your business and I can share what you say with my community and uh, online and everybody who says, okay, what to know how his business works, what he thinks about selling, what he thinks about uh, the life science industry and investing, listen to the podcast and then decide uh, whether to use it in his or her environment yeah. or not. Yeah. And I, I think that your perspective, I, I it completely resonates with me. Um, sometimes I get like, jaded when i hear you know what we were like earlier we we're talking about like new like a podcast that comes up in the feed and like i kind of like skip through a little bit and just hear it and sometimes people are they're like this is the one way to do it it's the <laughs> only way to do it and i'm like i don't i don't know if i agree with that um and i i, I think it's it's a kind of a choose your own adventure again mm -hmm. you know it's a lifestyle like business also is like lifestyle choices right like and everyone lives, has different preferences and you need to, you know, you, you build your business and you build your career around your own lifestyle choices and circumstances. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's very much just like the Biotech Stars podcast is very much an, an exercise of just like bringing as much educative content out mm -hmm. there and for letting anyone who's contemplating or on the journey decide what is the best for them. And then incorporate it. And if something doesn't resonate with you, ignore it. Like, it's okay. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't, if it doesn't work for you, no problem. Um, but at least you, if you could find something, at least one thing that's valuable, then I think that's in our mind a success. Um, because again, it all gets back to that North Star. We're trying to improve health mm -hmm. outcomes for all. And so the more success we see in the lab, the closer we get to that goal. Um, and and that's kind of the the impetus and the kind of the motivation of behind the podcast. I had such a fantastic time that we live in today. I'm now close to 50. And when I think back at the early 90s, whenever I thought this would be an interesting person to talk to, and this person happened to be somewhere in the United States, it meant traveling there. So having <laughs> a phone call was expensive or difficult yeah. back then. Um yeah when I wanted to talk with a teacher somewhere in the world, it meant at the university, it meant studying there. So leaving the own country, going there. And now everything is accessible on, online on the internet. Yeah. It's, uh, it's fantastic a beautiful for thing. You. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. And you know what, in a world we, we have these headphones that aren't connected to your, your phone anymore. <laughs> and, and you can, you know, have these conversations and yeah. you can do it on, you know, I, I'm obviously, in my you know in, indoors right now but i could i could potentially be doing this on a walk outside yeah, yeah, yeah. if i wanted to which is like what like what a what a time and i, I think you know i I'm, I'm excited for 
you know, those who are just starting the entrepreneurial journey, because there's so much out there to mm. learn and so much out there. Like, if you want to become an expert on something, you can become an expert. It's there at your fingertips. So it, it gets me really excited. Yeah, people just have to do it. <laughs> just have to yeah, do yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you need you need someone to, like my co-founder kick you in the butt <laughs> to like to, to figure it out. <laughs> This would be a nice idea for the next company. So get yeah, people yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when we when we look at uh, the ecosystem in your area, um, how is it for startups these days? So the I I think the the macroeconomic situation you know it's it 2022 was a very brutal year mm. um but i i do also you know if you look back like historically it's like the life sciences has always been a boom bust kind of like cyclical like in terms of like for the early you know kind of early cutting edge kind of like pushing the like the frontier research it's always been kind of like capital markets come and go mm. um now currently The, like the, the capital markets are still open for sure. It's just like the mentality of like, you know, the go-go of like when kind of like the right after the, the pen, like COVID kind of like, you know, first off, you know, first off the pandemic, like thought everyone thought everything was going to, going to disappear. And then the markets just started ripping like afterwards and going from that to now, I think, They, there's just a, the excess is starting to kind of burn off and, but there's still great research being funded. And I think the, it is important for those who are embarking on that journey to, you know, it, 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 thinking about capital efficiency is very important mm -hmm. and like, you know, having kind of a, a little bit of a bootstrap mentality goes a long way. Um, And, and and you can still be a venture backed company, but also have some bootstrap mentality in your operations, right? Like, don't burn the candle at both ends. <laughs> may, may, maybe plan for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe have you know things like you know it feel you know now you know it, it that you know when you are like when I was just starting, you know the the concept of like making a 24 month projection and updating your projection of like the roadmap of your company i know it sounds like you know a lot of work but it's important and it's kind of like the discipline of these things it's like scoping out your headcount scoping out like the roadmap of your research scoping out the finances and just like having this discipline and trying to and hold yourself to it and conveying that to investors is you know that will unlock funding opportunities for you. And obviously the research has to be sound, like your research has to be sound and the science has to be sound, but there's an emphasis for sure on being efficient and minimizing waste, um, which I think is healthy. I think it's very healthy. Um, and so that's what I would say. It's not just contained to Silicon Valley. I, I'd say, you know, broadly, because the life sciences is heavily venture backed, um, there's an, you know, it's, th they're still there. It just like there's an emphasis on efficiency um, and the IP, IPO markets, you know, who knows when those will open up again, but the M&A markets are kind of heating up. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, potential exits, perhaps it's not an IPO within the next 12, 18 months. Um, who knows that, that I'm, I'm, I would have to for, be a fortune teller to, to know when it opens back up, but we we're definitely seeing a lot of M&A activity. Um, that's for sure. So it's a different, it's a different world, but deaf and, and, you know, I think it's, it's a, the excess is kind of burnt off, you know, and now the mentality needs to change a little bit, but there's definitely funding opportunities for, for great teams, great founders, great signs. Did you, did you see, I mean, in, in your numbers, in numbers of a company, uh, did you see a difference between 2022 and 2023 uh, and 2021 in, in, your discussions with your potential customers in your sales process that there was a pullback from buying new equipment due to funding constraints yeah so interestingly the back when when things were kind of crazy go-go mm. um and i, I don't want to get overly financy 
but the, the concept of cost of capital was non-existent, right? And the cost of capital, just if I were to like distill it down, equity, raising venture capital is far more expensive than credit, which mm-hmm. is what our a lease is, right? A lease is like a fixed monthly payment. Mm-hmm. And yes, it's, it's going to be, you know, a little bit more than a dollar. Like if you have a dollar of credit, you're going to have to pay back a little bit more than a dollar. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you give up equity, it's you, you're giving up the infinite upside of your company. And that concept in the go-go days, no one really took it seriously because you can, you know, then some, someone's going to be banging on your door trying to fund you, right? <laughs> With equity, right? And this is what I mean is a little bit healthy. Like pe- mm-hmm. there's like people are now realizing, this, this is not a novel concept. This is like, this is basic finance. Um, and so what we've seen is that with this emphasis on efficiency and optimizing your, your weighted average cost of capital, um, the, there, you know, it hasn't stopped the need for equipment. The research needs to get done, right? Like I said, like the FDA is the FDA, their deadlines, their deadline. You're going to have to hit that deadline, (laughs) um, one way or another. And so people are now exploring, alternative ways to get their infrastructure needs met, particularly equipment. Um, you know, there's also the real estate aspect where people are like, maybe we can downsize the space. We can utilize some shared space versus just having a monster lease on a big building. <laughs> um, so people are looking for alternative ways to be more efficient in how they allocate their capital and time. And so we've a- actually seen folks who, who maybe have, in the go-go would have just opted to buy with equity are now seeing the value of not having to allocate, you know, a couple million bucks of their seed round mm-hmm. for equipment and rather finance it. Um, so that that's what we've seen is, is the mentality shift. So it's basically good for your business then. Yeah, it, it's, it's been busy. That That's for sure. Um, you know, and it's, I thought I was crazy <laughs> like for, for like when, when, when people are like, we've had so many conversations with people who are just like, yeah, we'll just buy it with equity. And we're just like, whoa, like the math, like, I don't know how this math pen- pencils out, but I, your decision is your decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and unfortunately there's been a lot of conversations where, you know, folks have kind of like buyer's regret. Like they had just bought a lot of equipment before the markets kind of dried up no, it's not fully dried up but it's kind of slowed down and now they have all this they, they've spent you know nowadays like seed rounds are like you know five to ten million mm-hmm. somewhere around there you know they've spent like half of their seed round on equipment and they're like we can't hire anymore because all that cash just went into the equipment um whereas you know now they're and and we we're, we've been able to help them with sale leasebacks where we purchase the equipment from them and then lease it back. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically they get that, you know, it's, they get a lease. They, and, and, and in effect, it's just like you are able to lease the equipment you recently bought. Um, but what ends up happening now is like people are now the awareness and understanding of this and the importance of this, where if you're getting a $5 million seed check and there, there's two, the success of your lab is, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here is contingent on having a killer team and having the tools, the equipment your, for your team to use mm-hmm. one without the other, you, you know, is, is, is you're kind of like, you're running a, a race with one leg. Right. <laughs> um, and so, because right. If you just have the equipment, but no one to use the equipment, mm-hmm. you're not going anywhere. If you have people, but no tools, you're still going really slowly. So leasing enables you to get the equipment without breaking the bank, which then allows you to hire the people to get your research done. And then the, you know, if you're a venture backed startup, this is music to the venture capitalists ears, right? Because now they're like, okay, great. You can, you, the likelihood of you reaching your milestone 12 months from now, now we can hit it in six or three or whatever it may be. And then that gets you to your next funding round. Like it kind of gets you to that next inflection point. Um, and so that concept is, I think, becoming more prevalent. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and this is 
you know, I, I think we're, we're starting to see the, the kind of the, the sea change. I mean, equipment leasing is a, is a great tool, in my opinion, for the reasons you described. Uh, you can allocate more capital to build your team. So you get, yeah. more ha- you get more hands working and still have the equipment. But yeah. there is one problem in especially, for example, ter- therapeutics drug development. Um, usually the, the funding rounds don't last forever. So yep. the they last for a couple of years, two or three years, and then the companies need to raise further funds. And yep. there is no guarantee that oh yeah the company is successful in raising yep. funds. Uh, a lot can happen. We can get a pandemic, a war can start, especially yep. here in Europe. Um, and the entire investment scene or community is turned over and uh, people don't want to invest anymore. Lease contracts, especially for expensive equipments, uh, don't make any sense when it's over one year or two years. So usually when I run a company, I would like to lease it for a longer period so that they have smaller installments at the beginning and not the whole payout in one year because then I can buy it myself. It's yep. it's no failure. I want to stretch out the capital. The risk for you then for a company like yours is that I, I can't successfully close the next round and they can't pay you anymore. How do you manage that risk that your yep. customers uh, don't exist anymore and you get the equipment back and uh, probably can't use some some machines? They are sometimes customized for special purposes. You can't yep. reset it. How do you manage that risk? Yeah, and so this gets back to uh, kind of our, what makes Exceder special, right? Mm-hmm. It's, we only do, we only work with labs. We only work with lab equipment. Mm-hmm. And we only work within the basically this the life sciences. Mm-hmm. Our expertise in that enables us to underwrite the risk. Mm-hmm. What what feels like equity risk, we we can better underwrite it because we understand it. Mm-hmm. Like we truly understand it. We, you know, when we when we evaluate a company, like you know, I use J.P. Morgan as an example, but some large institution, they're not going into the science. Mm-hmm. They're they're like send me three. Three years of profits. Okay. Did you have enough you, profits? You, you don't have that usually in a drug development yeah. company. <laughs> exactly. So you're know, like, show me three years of profits. Yeah. You don't have that? Next. Next next applicant, right? For us, we're, we're going in there holistically, right? Mm. We, we know the operations. We know the financials. We know in the industry. We know the equipment. So we are able to, and that's why we were talking about sales earlier, is like customizing, right? We customize the lease to fit up, it has to be appropriate for your labs, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for your specific lab. You know, for example, uh, an R&D therapeutic company is very different than a contract research org, right? Who has cash flows. Sometimes there are therapeutics companies that also do contract research. Sometimes they have royalties from their license, like from licensing. Mm-hmm. They have collaboration, they have partnerships. There's all these elements of a, life science company comes in a bunch of different flavors and we are able to evaluate that because this is our world. Right. And, you know, we, all the time people are like, will you do a tractor or an RV lease? We have to say no to that. That's not a good fit. (laughs) We're not, we're not tractor or RV experts and that's okay. Right. And that's okay. We're the life science people. And, you know, and we work with folks in, in climate and renewables as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and, and also like the kind of, uh, you know, kind of like, I guess the, the bio ag and like all the new kind of like, you know, industrial bio industrial applications. Anyways, that what you were describing is, is our job to, again, find a win win. Mm-hmm. We, we are taking risk. There is no, you know, it's a risk reward. We are taking risk. We understand that. Um, but it's kind of like poker. You're, we're sizing up what is appropriate. We're not going all in on every single, right? If you, if you, you're you going to lose your poker game if you just go all in every time a hand gets dealt, right? <laughs> yeah. You're going to lose. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So it, it's us, it's our job to evaluate the applicant holistically. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've been doing this for so long. We, we have a very, very intimate understanding of this. And that's why our leases, you know, we, you know, we, we kind of are able to find that win-win situation. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. What, 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 what do you do in such cases when a startup company runs out of cash? 
Um, so we we have to pick up the equipment, <laughs> like, um, and, and you know, and and that's the name of the game. You know, mm-hmm. if you know if they if the lease can't be fulfilled, we have to pick up the equipment, mm-hmm. and, and and that's that's part of the risk that we underwrite, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and hopefully we knock on wood. We you know we we want to see them successful. So mm-hmm. we're going to do everything in our power to help them get to that next funding round. Um, you know, put them in touch with the right people. You know. Mm-hmm. If we can put them in touch with investor, we're going to do so. Um, and, and that's part of the benefit of being in this ecosystem mm. is that we also know the venture capitalists too. <laughs> um, so we can, we can connect the dots. If some, and you know, if someone is, you know, if we can help and lend a hand, we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, but it don't take equity at the end of the day. So then the end of the day, it must be a win-win. So it must be a, uh, foreseeable win-win is sometimes uh, had the also some parties here in Europe who say okay, I mean, uh, give me equity in case uh, come back. Yeah, some some folks do that, so we mm. don't ask for equity. Um, mm. That that's that's for that's for the founders and the uh, the original set of investors. That's like that's for them. Um, you know, we you know here is the lease payment. Yeah, we want a lease that will help you help us. And we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to complicate things by asking for equity in your company. You've, you guys are the experts here on running your, your lab. So um, the, that, that, that ought to be yours. When, it, when you look at your customer side, what's your biggest success story? So uh, when we look at, uh, for example, startups, how did your company help them become successful? Yeah. Um, so as, as actually, um, close friend of mine, uh, Jake Glanville, I have a close friend and colleague. Um, he was the, the first guest on the biotech startups podcast. Um, he was mm-hmm. the first episode, first guest. Um, I love, I love talking about him and his company. Um, so distributed bio, um, was his original company. And we, you know, we basically helped them from the super early days, like probably like sub five employees, Mm-hmm. It was them uh, in an incubator space, um, getting them the you know, getting them with the equipment they needed at that phase, and that helped them, you know, as they kind of took over more and more bench space at the lab space. You know, we helped them get the equipment, and then they finally outgrew that, and they they got their own. They got their own floor, um, and you know, at their they were a very interesting company. Um, they they were both a R and D and contract research mm-hmm. work. Um, so we were facil- helping them, you know, on all fronts and with the more equipment that they were able to get, they were able to do more R and D and also do more contract research. So it brought in more service revenue and that helped them get to those next inflection points. You know, I remember when, when they got their second floor and then we, you know, we helped them with the equipment there. Um, and then they ultimately sold to, to Charles river. Um, Ooh. and, and so, you know, that, and so that journey was like, you know, it was a, a small team on a shared bench all the mm-hmm. way to acquisition. Um, and, and we continue to work. And then uh, Jake also now runs Cenovax, which was the spin out of that, uh, of distributed bio. Um, and we continue to work with him uh, to this day. And mm-hmm. I, I think the, the kind of our ability to work at the state, even at the stage of like when someone's just sharing a lab bench, all the way up to whether it's an IPO or is an acquisition is that we take great pride in. Um, and also we're not going to like, look, we're going to also tell you if a lease is not, is not right at that time. Right. Like if you're, if you're, if you're leasing too much, it could be also become a burden. Mm. So we will also tell you that, right. Like we want to win, win. So we want to do what's right for you and what's right for us. Um, and we want to help you get there. Um, whether mm. it's, you know, a handful of people, you know, all the way up to like 50 people or more, you know, so um, that, that distributed bio is a, um, I, I love to talk about them. Um, really, really cool story. They were in the Netflix um, movie, uh, Pandemic. Um, they were a, a kind of a star of, of that, of that series. Um, so take a look at them if you guys have a chance. What is the name of the series? Pandemic? Uh, pandemic. Pandemic. Um, yeah. On, on, yeah. On, on Netflix. I thought not the real pandemic. So it's the, it's uh, the yeah, yeah. Well, so they distributed bio. Um, they, mm. they, they do a lot of vaccine R and D. Mm. 
Um, so it was like right in their wheelhouse um, yeah. when everything was kind of going crazy. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. So your role, I think, uh, when I look at investing in, in companies, uh, therapeutics, labs, they have basically two cost positions. One is then leasing, if this are your customers, and HR. So there is not much more <laughs> at, uh, yeah. in that. Uh, is, 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 uh, except studies, of course. Um, yep. So you, you must be then a major position in the profit and loss statement. And I can imagine that sometimes probably one or the other investor would like to speak with you when they do their due diligence. So you must be exposed basically to the entire investment landscape in Silicon Valley with your work. Yeah, we, we talk to investors a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it, you know, I, and I think from the, in, the, we get a lot of temperature checks um, with them and kind of see where they're at. Um, and they're actively deploying, that's for mm -hmm. sure. And I think, Venture has a right place and a right time for an equity infusion. Leasing is a right place and a right time. And it's finding the right combination mm -hmm. um, of the two. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, you know, equity financing and credit. Um, you don't want to be over leveraged and have too many leases. You know, that's, you know, that, that's also a problem. But you also don't want to be like too heavily equity, fi you know, financed where, you know, you that's the risk of dilution. So, mm -hmm. It's, it's finding that balance um, and we collaborate all the time with them. Mm. How do you see, I mean, we had uh, the glorious days until up to 2022 uh, yeah. where capital was basically available for free, abundance, everybody got financed. And uh, I think in every incubation program in Europe and probably also in the United States, the first lesson founders got was not find your customer, it was find your investor. Yep. And then it changed last year with, uh, especially here in Europe, it's attributed to the to the war in Ukraine. Um, how do you see the development of uh, availability of venture capital in Silicon Valley in the next 10 years? Yeah, so it is hard to, to call it and make a, 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 a prediction with any mm -hmm. sort of like concreteness. But I always come back to the science being as exciting as you know has ever been um there's a lot of new modalities that are you know are available like to to solve really pressing healthcare issues mm -hmm. and there's a lot of smart people too working on these problems and i think healthcare and life sciences is a of growing importance um People ultimately want to live longer, healthier lives and more, more fulfilling lives. And so I think the equity financing and venture capital ecosystem, they, they, they realize this and will continue to fund good founders, good research. And the research is great right now. And there's a great amount of like founders that are coming out of, you know, whether it's big pharma, academic institutions, you name it. And that combination of a, you know, secular trend where, you know, people want to live healthier and good research is going to get funded to, to in that, it's the North Star, right? Mm -hmm. That's the North Star of our industries to like have people live healthier, longer lives and the money will follow. Mm -hmm. it, it may not be smooth. It may be like this. And in the moment, it feels like we're never going to get out of these trenches, but it's always a boom bust. And it'll, it'll, over time, it'll net out. So maybe, sorry, the camera's wrong. It'll net out, right? It'll go, yeah. it'll go in the right direction. So that's, that's where I see it going. Obviously, I could be a little bit biased <laughs> um, because I am a, you know, a participant in this ecosystem. But that's how I see it. And it, it might feel painful right now. But you know, we've gone through cycles before. And this is a cycle. And as long as the North Star is right, I think we'll be just fine. I think it's a natural law. It's always up and down. It's a boom and bust. Yep. So there was this 87 was a huge crisis. Then the dot-com bubble burst in 2000. Uh, I think Amazon was down 90% yeah. back then. Who would have yeah. guessed Apple went uh, was close to extinction in the 90s? Yeah. Um, then we had 2007 and 8, 
we had 2012 and then a whole lot of minor crises and it always is up and down up and down yep exactly and i think just not getting overly fixated on like the next three months even the next mm -hmm. 12 months try to think even longer mm -hmm. and ask yourself from like first principles like does like what are the dynam the dynamics of this and I, I think you'll you'll probably come to the same conclusion that mm -hmm. you know it's worthwhile being optimistic about life sciences and healthcare I mean, I come to one conclusion when I look at Europe. Uh, we still have the same problem like 17 years ago. It's very, mm -hmm. Europe is a great place for science. There is a lot of public funding on the market. And I think this makes Europe unique. Um, it's very attractive for basic researchers to come to Europe, tap into the um, public funding pots. When I look at seed rounds, uh, they're a little bit smaller than in the United States still. But there is enough capital on the market to get companies off the ground. Yep. But Series A, Series B, Series C, IPOs, um, we have the problem here in Europe that there is not enough capital. That's why the best companies from Europe always look towards the United States. I think uh, CRISPR Therapeutics, for example, Gene Editing, yep. uh, with Emmanuel Charpentier and Rodka Novak running the company or starting the company a couple of uh, years ago, uh, Boston. Uh, other companies relocated from Europe to the San Francisco area. What's your advice for European companies when they say, okay, I mean, we don't find funding here. We have great tech. We have the world's best tech. We have the best team. Everybody's willing to relocate to San Francisco. What's your advice besides uh, you are there for leasing and you can yeah, be, oh, yeah, yeah, give yeah. the equipment. What's your advice in navigating the investment landscape? Yeah. So I would say there's a couple of aspects. Um, I think the United States is having a somewhat of like a Cambrian explosion of, you know, it's not just San Francisco anymore mm -hmm. or the, the Bay area. It, and it's not just Boston anymore. Um, you know, Seattle, San Diego, Philadelphia, New York, North Carolina, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And obviously, you know, this tends to cluster around research universities <laughs> There are plenty of places, again, this gets back to capital efficiency and just like weighing those out. So there are plenty of areas that where you have great pools of talent, a bunch of real, real estate options, and also proximity to investors and, and industry peers, which are, I would say, the, a key criteria, like you need to be able to, to access those things to have for those are the ingredients for success. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I, I don't think it's necessarily just exclusive to Silicon Valley. So a recommendation is to look into other areas that are up and coming. And that will enable you to, and, and a lot of those areas are investing, like this actual governments are investing in infrastructure and resources for those that are starting life science companies or you know, setting, setting down roots. And so, you know, for example, New York is, New York's not cheap, but they are building a ton, a ton of lab space. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, South San Francisco is always, you know, is always building lab space, but, you know, they've been building lab space since Genentech just got, got started in the 80s. So it's, that it's very developed. Um, so, and basically making these key considerations, pools, where is the pool of talent? the real estate options and proximity to investors and industry peers. Mm -hmm. And you can just do like, this is like the research that you can do is like, you can Google this. Um, it's, it's, you know, you don't need to hire McKinsey to do this research for you. <laughs> um, you can Google this and take a look at that. And you'll see that you might be able to get a very high standard, a high level for a much lower cost. Right. And again, it's right now raising investments is all about efficiency. Like also good founders, good science, but also you, there's an element of being efficient, right? Mm -hmm. So in being in San Francisco, which is very, very expensive, may not be the right solution. But of course, we have very rich talent, industry peers and, and uh, investors, but that's also elsewhere too. So that's what I would say, open the aperture. Like be open to the idea of not necessarily go, having to be in Silicon Valley, 
and you know looking in in these other hotbeds rushing a long-term dream of many people to relocate to San Francisco and the Bay Area yeah. um yeah. but it's true I think uh, last year I had uh E.J. Caraway from from Georgia on the podcast and uh I met her at the bio in San Diego and for me it was always the United States was always Boston and San Francisco so these are these two big hubs where yeah. you can relocate and she started uh telling the same story like you did no there are more spots now in the United States and I said why are we not aware of that here in Europe when I ask our development organizations they always recommend Boston and San Francisco and it seems there's a lot going on in in the States yeah yeah it's I I think Boston and Silicon Valley and San Francisco just are able to live you know in the the minds of like it's also very it's it's in the headlines hmm. um but there are plenty plenty of opportunities elsewhere um which should not i think it's uh often goes overlooked um hmm. but are uh, of are are great opportunities would you be open uh that people contact you i mean you have a great overview about uh the ecosystems in the united states um when they are really serious about relocating and consider working together with you would it be open that they contact you also yeah. for questions which ecosystem would be the best fit for the pool of talents they're looking for the lab space in combination yeah. with availability of funding yeah absolutely cool. cool yeah people can definitely reach out um yeah and my 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 team is also really really knowledgeable knowledgeable mm. about it as well we have you know uh exceder has folks on the west coast and east coast and all over the place so um they we actually have like boots in the ground <laughs> in those areas too so um yeah more than happy to chat it's fun talking to you but i had just a look at uh the time and i think we are almost at two hours <laughs> so yeah yeah time flies when you have fun i have to yeah, jump absolutely. to the to the final questions uh yeah. what's your long-term vision for your company where do you see your company in the next 10 years yeah so you know honestly i it it, it almost sounds like the next 10 years i even want to extend it like just like mm -hmm. wait wait I, i touched on this like earlier like mm -hmm. i want exceder to be a generational company mm -hmm. and in the next 10 years we're doing everything that we we can to to further that effort mm -hmm. um so it's better serving scientists getting them the equipment they need and getting them basically to accelerate their research and hit their milestones and commercialization efforts faster um you know and i think we're trying we're you know we haven't talked about it publicly yet but we're finding ways to further improve our leases and provide more value um, to our clientele with exclusive, you know, kind of exclusive perks. So, you know, we're continuing to find, again, that is, a, it's about growing the pie. Mm. And so we're trying to find ways to continue to expand that pie and provide more value to our, to our clientele. So in the next 10 years, I, you know, it, it, I guess it, it doesn't sound overly grand, you know, grandiose, but it's just like doing more of what we currently do and doing it better. Um, And perhaps there, maybe there's an expansion um, into another country in the next 10 years, um, but we'll see. Conquer Europe. Conquer Europe. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not conquer. We'll, we'll, we'll dip our toes and, and just like kind of see um, and, and fig, you know, figure it out. Yeah. Um, we have three minutes left. Uh, is there any point that you would like to address on this podcast and that I didn't ask questions about? No. Honestly, I think we've we've covered a lot of like fantastic topics, um, and I, I think I guess the one just kind of reminder I you know want to leave with people is just like it takes a village to this science is hard, like science is super hard, and it takes a village and it takes a team. Um, so you know, be you know I'm I'm very grateful for those that have supported Exceder along the way. Um, my wife. I couldn't have done it without her, my co-founder, Jeff, the, the amazing Exceder team. And also I was going to give a shout out to um, an organization that I, I'm really, really excited about, Nucleate. So Nucleate is a, I, 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 I compare them to basically the Y Combinator for the science, life sciences oh. and the sciences. Um, they're a student run organization that's a nonprofit that mm -hmm. is fostering scientific entrepreneurship Um, and they're they're basically teaching 
PhDs and MBAs um, and pairing them. And mm -hmm. basically <clears throat> they are helping them with company formation. They're helping them with entrepreneurship, teaching them the ins and outs, how to pitch, how to fundraise, you know, running a company, you name it. Um, and they're helping the next generation of folks who are trying to translate science out of academia mm -hmm. into, uh, you know, the, the private sector. Um, and we're, we love them. We, they're a fantastic organization, um, really, really love their mission. Um, and so, you know, just want to give them a shout out too, because um, I, I think they're going to play a big role in, in, in the future of, of, of biotech and the life sciences. Uh, what's the website of the organization? Um, nucleate dot x y z I'll, i'll actually drop this in chat dot x y c x y c that's an it's the first time i see this here we have it let's just flash it and they're and they're in europe as well oh really yep so It's this one. Yep. We empower biotech leaders. It's the Y combinator of the life science industry. I didn't know them. And and they, they don't take equity. Um, it's just to foster entrepreneurship. Atlas Venture, MassBio, 5AM Ventures, Harvard University, Stanford. World class advisors. It's really great. Thanks for pointing that out. And this yeah. seems to be the locations. So where are they in Europe? I, th I think if you, yeah, there you go. I'm curious, sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> I know they're in Germany, Switzerland, um, the UK. They, okay. they have locations. Um, That's great, they have to look it up. And they're, and they're continuous to, to expand as well. Um, Okay, Definitely so they don't recommend people checking them out. So they don't take equity, and their model is basically to support companies in their formation. Yep, and hook them up with uh, VCs, train them, mm -hmm. and yep. similar similar to Y Combinator. Yep, but without the equity. But 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 how can they survive then? I mean, when this... it's a nonprofit. Um, oh, yeah. So it's a nonprofit, um, and you know, donations, you know, sponsorships, and stuff like that. Um, so they're very much aligned with, you know, the folks that go through their program. We love them. They're great. And, you know, all the people who go through their program are a blast to work with. Um, and we love, and we love working with the nuclear team. Thanks for the shout out at the end. I know whom I contact for the next episode. <laughs> Just ask yeah. them to come or come online. It would be a great thing to have them. Uh, yeah. John, two hours. It's so fast. It's fantastic speaking to you, listening to your stories. Congratulations to the success. Uh, to you and your team and keep inspiring and keep moving your company forward and help scientists. Yeah, Christian, thank you for the time. I, I appreciate it. Um, it was a blast. And uh, yeah, let, let's do this again soon. Super. Have a great day. Bye.